Hi everybody, Hunter the Honda Nakanin here, and welcome to this special unscheduled couch vlog. And the reason I'm doing this special couch vlog, and you probably already read the title, so you should know, uh, this is me giving my general thoughts on the new Shira Princesses of Power Netflix series, which is a reboot of the original filmation uh, Shira Princess of Power series. Over the weekend, I got a chance to watch the whole first season, and from that it seems to indicate that we are gonna get a second season at some point. And I figured people would want to hear what I had to say about it, considering my previous He-Man and She-Ra episode reviews. And just a quick note on the She-Ra episode reviews. They will be coming back again, uh, but probably at the earliest, early next year. I'm having some issues with them right now, but considering that this year, 2018, I've technically made more He-Man videos than most years, even without doing like a big 10-week He-Man thing like I used to do back in the day. I mean, we, we have plenty of He-Man videos for this channel, so hold your horses, She-Ra is coming back next year. But for the meanwhile, let's talk about the She-Ra Princesses of Power. Now, this is going to be a really general overview, I'm, I'm not going to go too into detail on individual episodes, so I'm going to try to keep this relatively spoiler-free. And what I'm going to do in this video is that first I'm just going to give some general thoughts on the show as a whole, what I think uh, of the presentation and I think and what I think were kind of the biggest virtues of this particular series. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the main characters and there's and there's three good guys and three bad guys I specifically want to talk about. And then just a general overview of some of the supporting characters. Then I will talk a little bit about the couple of pet peeves I had with this show. And finally at the end I will give some general thoughts also, but I will also say what I think would be cool to see in the second season of this series. First of all, just on a general level, I want to say that I really, really like the writing of this show. It's traditionally animated and the animation quality is really good. I mean, the original filmation show was really, really good, especially if you compare it to He-Man. But I was really glad that they did go with the traditional animation look and I really dig the art style. Obviously, a lot of the characters have been redesigned, but generally I did like what they did with them. But I will talk a little bit more about these changes overall. They did some very clever writing decisions, most of which I was really happy with. There's maybe one or two things I wasn't really a fan of, but they were really minor things. In fact, from the presentation point of view, the only thing that I maybe wasn't too wild about was the music. And I know that's a really unfair comparison considering the original show soundtrack was made by Shuki Levi. There is this one really cool synth-heavy piece of music they used uh, a lot in the first episode and a little bit incidentally towards the end of the series, but I really like if there's one thing in the presentation that I didn't like it was really the music. Everything else is fine, including the voice acting. But the two things that I really, really like about this show, and which I thought were its biggest virtues, is that it actually fixed two of my biggest criticisms that I often bring up in when I've reviewed episodes of the original filmation, She-Ra. Now, number one amongst them is actually the fact that She-Ra is nowhere near as OP as she was in the original show, and honestly, this is a big deal for me. Now, as I discussed in a certain list video I did not too long ago, of course, He-Man is the kind of character who also just magically spawns superpowers whenever the plot requires it. But the thing I always had a problem with in She-Ra is that She-Ra's she power set from the very beginning is so ridiculously OP that it kind of destroys all tension in the show that there could be. I mean, seriously, the Horde is just not a real threat to She-Ra in the original show. The other big thing, and this was really, really big, and I really love that they did this for the show, was the fact that they actually did focus a lot on the main trio of Adora, Glimmer, and Bo, which I will talk about in more detail when we get to the character part. The other big problem I always have with She-Ra is that even though She-Ra has this big, broad cast of supporting characters, most of them are pretty interchangeable. Unlike He-Man's supporting characters, were pretty consistent and play a big part in the storylines most of the time. And it's because of this why a lot of the support characters in the original filmation show just never really stood out for me. With one or two exceptions here and there. And as I said in my really, really old and terrible overview of the original filmation She-Ra, which I honestly feel that I gave a much more negative image of the show than I did, because obviously in the later She-Ra episode reviews I've often brought up a lot of the good things about this show, but it is true that I do think the Horde characters were always way more interesting. But let's finally talk about the characters. 
And we'll start off with Adora, and I'm happy to say that Adora really is one of the big focus points of this series. And there's two big reasons for this. Number one is that they make a much bigger deal of the fact that Adora grew up with the Horde. So when she joins the Rebellion at the beginning of the series, she has a much harder time fitting in than she did in the Filmation show where she just kind of slipped in and nobody even blinked an eye. I think this was a really, really good thing, and there's other excellent character development that they did with her, which I'll talk about a little bit more once we get to the bad guys. But the other great thing, and I was a little bit surprised by this, is the fact that not only does Adora very rarely even become Shira on the show, I actually like the fact that they completely did away with Adora having a secret identity as Shira. Basically, in this show, all the characters know she's Shira. Now, the secret identity thing is also something that I think a lot of people raise an eyebrow at when we talk about He-Man, but at least in He-Man and Masters of the Universe, Adam having a secret identity made a little bit more sense because he's literally a prince. Because if it was just public knowledge that Adam was He-Man, then basically it would be just really easy for the villains to get rid of He-Man. All they would have to do is jump Adam when he's not He-Man and that would be the end of it. And this is something that I always felt was really awkward about the Filmation Shira show because it was very obvious that they copied that idea of Shira just having a secret identity from the original show, yet it, yet I never really understood for whose benefit Adora was keeping up this facade of having a secret identity. In a lot of Shira episodes, it just creates this awkward situation where Adora has to duck down into the bushes and become Shira and then come up with some explanation for why she wasn't present for the battle. And you would think with her being an ex-Horde trooper, that would raise suspicion. But yeah, I'm really glad that they did this very brave decision for this show, and I think it works brilliantly. And I especially like it because Glimmer and Bowler are like the first ones to find out, so it's never really an issue with these characters. Speaking of Glimmer, I have to say, she is a way better character in the new show than she ever was in the original Filmation series. I'm sorry this might feel blasphemous for some people, but Glimmer really was a bit of a brat on the Filmation show. You know this if you've watched some of my previous episodes. And don't get me wrong, I still like her as a character, but she is just way more fleshed out in this series. She has a way more interesting personality, and like I said, that chemistry between her, Bo, and Adora is really the thing that carries the series for me. And yeah, I do think I had a little double take when I saw her redesign, but honestly, after watching the show, I really got used to it. And I do think it actually looks kind of nice. The fact that she now just has teleportation powers is kind of weird, but uh, it works well, and, and they also managed to pull a lot of comedy from it. Now, as for Bo, I'm kind of hard-pressed to say that Bo is a better character than in the original show, because Bo is barely a character in the original show anyway. In this show, he occasionally gets to be like the voice of reason, it gets occasional funny lines. So yeah, I didn't dislike the original Bo, and I like this new version just as much. Now let's talk about the bad guys, and there's three main bad guys that I really needed to talk about. Hordak, Shadow, Weaver, and Catra. So let's talk about the most prominent of them all, Catra. Yep, Catra. Because in this show, Catra and Adora actually have history together, and this is another great thing about this show. They actually focus on this a lot. I really like the redesign of her. Both, I think both me and Minna said the same thing, that she kind of looks like a cross between Ryoko and Ryooki. But if Glimmer was way, way improved from the original show, then I think Catra takes home absolutely the prize for the most improved character from the show. I mean, I like Catra in the original show as well. She, she really is one of the most recurring villains in the original show as well. But her voice performance is kind of silly and everything. And as I've said before, so her character is way more fleshed out in this series. I think they did a really good job with it. Now as for Shadow Weaver, she's easily the second most prominent villain of the series, but I had slightly mixed feelings about her. I do like the fact that she does play a big, big role in the series. And this is a minor spoiler, but it's said in the first episode, so I think I'm entitled to say this. This show pretty much comes out of the gate saying that it was Shadow Weaver who stole Adora from Eternia as a baby and not Hordak. So, he, so she also has this kind of evil stepmother baggage on the show, which honestly I'm not really a big fan of. Shadow Weaver is absolutely one of my favorite characters from the original show. So this one I feel a little conflicted about. I did think her redesign was okay, nothing wrong with that. I kind of end off with her on a weird note at the end of the series. This is something I do hope they expand upon in the second series. So I like her, but I have a hard time saying that I like her better than on the Filmation show. And then finally, Hordak, and honestly, I don't have a lot to say about Hordak. 
because he's like barely in the series at all. He appears incidentally during the first half of season one and then a bit more towards the end of the season. I mean, he is more competent than his filmation counterpart. I think the voice performance is good, but we don't even get to see him in a fight, which is a letdown, but I also, I kind of understand why they did this. It's pretty obvious they're building up to something big for the next season. And also, like I said, so much the show focuses on the main trio and also the relationship between Adora and Katra. And I think this is the main reason why Hordak is barely in the series at all. Now, as for the other characters, the main thing that I kind of noticed is that they really cleaned up the cast and got rid of a lot of the goofy support characters. So yeah, there's no Cal, there's no Twidgets. There aren't even a lot of Hordesmen in this series, which surprised me. The princesses are much more important, so Perfuma, Mermista, Frosta, and Entrapta. And I also understand the reason for this, because the, because the ongoing storyline through season one is that Adora and company are trying to reforge something called the Princess Alliance, which is supposed to defend Etheria against the Horde. And I didn't like this, it, gave, it definitely gave the season a definitive structure, but at the same time it does bring up one of the pet peeves that I have about the show. And surprisingly, this is the same pet peeve that I did have with the 2002 He-Man and Masters of the Universe reboot, but which I didn't talk about in my original review video of that series. But here's the thing, with the show titles He-Man and the Masters of the Universe and She-Ra Princess of Power, I'm okay with the show having kind of a subtitle. It would be kind of weird if the title of the She-Ra show was literally just Shira. I like having the Princess of Power subtitle, but I do have to stress this, that in the original show, they never used that title. They only said it out loud in the trailers. Same thing with He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, even though it's the subtitle of the show, in the original show, there was never any mention of who the Masters of the Universe are. In the Dolph Lundgren movie, they made a point that the Master of the Universe was basically anybody who controlled Grayskull, and that was fine, I accepted that explanation, it made sense especially because they didn't have He-Man in the title specifically. But in the 2002 series, I always hated how He-Man just out of the blue decides that the good guy team should be called the Masters of the Universe, and he keeps calling them the Masters throughout. For me, that subtitle was really just meant for the audience, and I never really required an explanation for it. And this is why I have a bit of a pet peeve with the fact that in this show, Princess is a title that literally means someone ruling a part of Etheria, but it also means someone who just has special powers, like She-Ra. So that's my pet peeve, but I will admit it's a very minor one. Now, as for my other pet peeves about this show, and I kind of already hinted at it, was the fact that there were so few Hordesmen. I mean, halfway through the series, we do get Scorpia. It was nice seeing her, but there's no Mantena or Leech. We maybe had Grizzler in there. Also, this is an interesting thing about the princesses and the cast as a whole. They've all been made much younger than in the original filmation show. Frosta is literally 10. And this has a kind of a funny outcome because the Horde Troopers are also teenagers, which I think in a weird way explains why they're so incompetent. And again, like I said, this is a pet peeve for me because I really like those goofy Horde characters from the show. But again, I understand this is simply because the show focuses so much more on Adora, Bo, and Glimmer. The same reason why we don't have as many goofy characters, I mean, Madame Raz does appear for like one episode. The secondary reason is probably so that the main characters have much more free range to make like jokes and witty remarks and everything, which per I'm personally fine with. As some of you might have noticed that I'm not saying a whole lot about Swiftwind, that's something that I don't want to spoil. I'll leave that up to you, but I recommend watching the whole series to see what happens with him. So finally, what about a season two? And I have no way of knowing if they're ever actually going to make a second season. I really don't have an idea uh, how popular this show is. I assume it depends on how many people watch this show. And personally, I feel okay with having a second season. And what would I like to see in the second season? Well, the first one is kind of obvious. Yes, I want to see more Hordesmen. Like, not too many, maybe one or two. And if we can only get one more, then Please, please bring back Mantena. I really didn't miss his goofy ass in this show. Also, the other thing that they kind of hint at, and they did manage to cleverly dance around without ever really fully addressing it, is Shira's and her sword's connection to Eternia. And we all know that when you mention Eternia, the logical end conclusion, of course, is that somewhere down the line, we are gonna get a He-Man cameo. 
But that's actually the thing that I'm a little bit more uncertain about. You'd think that I'd be all for for a He-Man cameo, and don't get me wrong, whenever He-Man cameos in She-Ra, it's always something I really, really like. But it's something that I maybe would want them to do a little bit further down the line and not necessarily right at the beginning of season two. Like, I like the vibe that they have with the show right now. I like the character development. Maybe one of the things that I would really want to see in season two is maybe just a couple of episodes strictly on She-Ra's supporting cast. Like, I wouldn't mind it seeing a whole episode with Mermista and Seahawk who I originally thought I was going to dislike because they really did turn him into a bit of a joke character, but once I saw the full episode, I do kind of love this version of Seahawk as well. Overall, how do I feel about She-Ra Princesses of Power? I can't help but to draw a comparison with my review of the 2002 He-Man series where I said, well, I love some of the things that they did on that show. Because He-Man and the Masters of the Universe is my all-time favorite cartoon show, no matter how good of a He-Man cartoon you make, you're never going to make something that is going to top the original Filmation cartoon for me. However, like I said, I don't feel as strongly about She-Ra even though I like it. And in that perspective, I'm fully confident saying that She-Ra, Princesses of Power, is the superior show. It's really well written, the characters are really good, and even with all my pet peeves, they are so minor for the most part. And most of it is explained simply by the nature of the show itself that, honestly, I didn't mind. Yeah, so this show tops the original Shira for me easily. So anyway, that concludes my thoughts on the new Shira Netflix series. I highly recommend you go see it. And until next time, I have the power, so can you.